Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant. Copyright 1939 by Will Durant. Copyright renewed 1966 by Will Durant. This recording of the full-length reading of The Life of Greece was published by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mehel, trustee, Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mehel and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1994 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Please observe the following procedures as you listen to these tapes. If you have borrowed this book from your local library, please return it to them at the end of the agreed period. If you are one of our regular rental customers, you may keep this book for 30 days from date of receipt by you, but after that time we charge additional rental of 25 cents per day. Dates are checked by postmark. Please return this book at the earliest possible time so another subscriber can have the use of this recording. To return cassettes to us, make sure they are all packaged in their plastic cassette cases and in proper order in the mailing container. Kindly seal the mailing container for return. Postage is already paid. Drop in any mailbox for return to books on tape. Should a cassette fail to play properly, hold it flat in the palm of your hand and slap it smartly against a hard flat surface. If this does not work or if you cannot otherwise free the reels, and if you are a library customer, please ask your local library to contact Books on Tape for a replacement cassette. If you are one of our rental customers, please call us at our regular customer service number. Give us the name of the book and number of the cassette. We will immediately send you a replacement at no charge. Discard the broken cassette. The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant. This book consists of 30 chapters and is 671 pages long. The following material appears on the dust jacket of the book. In this magnificent survey of the culture of ancient Greece, you will discover the mysterious lost civilization of the island of Crete, land of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth, the violent society of Homer's Iliad, the rise of classical Greece, a society of traders and navigators, explorers and colonists, soldiers, sailors and settlers, the origins of democracy and the political legacy to the Western world, the heroic battles against the Persians at Marathon and Salamis to preserve independence, tiny Greece in rebellion against the imperial tyranny from the east, the golden age of Athens, its architecture, poetry, dance, masked drama, religious mysteries, sculpture, and Olympic contests, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the birth of the academy, the blossoming of philosophical thought amid a society still rooted in slavery and barbarism. Alexander the Great, the soldier king who was Aristotle's pupil, who could mount a chariot at full speed, who tamed the giant horse Bucephalus, who fought the enemy hand to hand beside his own troops, who traveled from northern Greece across the Near East, Iraq, and Persia to India, and died having conquered it all in nine years. The end of Greece's golden age in a bloodbath of civil war and disorder, and the collapse of democracy. In the course of his dynamic synthesis of world history, Will Durant attacks in this volume the absorbing, perennially fascinating problem of Greek civilization. The Life of Greece, Volume 2 of The Story of Civilization, is a large, generous book whose style recalls the golden age of historical writing before specialization had invaded the field. Dr. Durant tells the whole story of Hellas, from the days of Crete's vast Aegean empire to the extirpation of the last remnants of Greek liberty, crushed under the heel of an implacably forward-marching Rome, the dry minutiae of battles and sieges, of tortuous statecraft of tyrant and king, are given less emphasis in what is preeminently a vivid recreation of Greek culture, brought to the reader through the medium of a supple and vigorous prose. Will Durant looked at the life of Greece and looked at it whole, quite as whole indeed as a cultivated 5th century Athenian, with his eager, constantly searching mind, looked at the superb panorama of Periclean Athens. The best insight into Dr. Durant's method of writing history can be found in the following sentence from the section on the age of Pericles. When Pericles, Aspasia, Phidias, Anaxagoras, and Socrates attended a play by Euripides in the theater of Dionysus, Athens could see visibly the zenith and unity of the life of Greece, statesmanship, art, science, philosophy, literature, 
religion, and morals, living no separate career as in the pages of chroniclers, but woven into one many-colored fabric of a nation's history. The familiar analogy between Athens and the great modern democracies is fruitfully enlarged upon in the life of Greece. The astute Pericles had to face much the same sort of problems that the astute Franklin D. Roosevelt had to face in the 1930s. The building of the Parthenon was part of Pericles' WPA program. Many lived on the dole, and the administration of the dole money was not without its scandals. Taxation and tax evasion were both as ingenious as they are today. The class war, family limitation, sexual freedom, and the conflict between religion and science played their part in a civilization resembling our own in everything except machines. The life of Greece teems with epigram and wit, and a philosopher's considered judgment. A nation is born stoic and dies epicurean. The games of the young are as old as the sins of their fathers. This persistent effort to subordinate fancy to reason is the dominant quality of the Greek mind, even of Greek poetry. Therefore, Greek literature is modern, or rather contemporary. We find it hard to understand Dante or Milton, but Euripides and Thucydides are kin to us mentally, and belong to our age. And that is because, though myths may differ, reason remains the same, and the life of reason makes brothers of its lovers in all times and everywhere. Like a great drama, the life of Greece finds a climax in 5th century Athens, and Will Durant's picture of the city of Pericles is a masterpiece of synthesis, compressing into about 200 pages the high spots and eternal significances of what many have considered the most fruitful epic in history. Dedication to my friend, Max Schott. Preface My purpose is to record and contemplate the origin, growth, maturity, and decline of Greek civilization, from the oldest remains of Crete and Troy to the conquest of Greece by Rome. I wish to see and feel this complex culture, not only in the subtle and impersonal rhythm of its rise and fall, but in the rich variety of its vital elements, its ways of drawing a living from the land and of organizing industry and trade, its experiments with monarchy, aristocracy, democracy, dictatorship and revolution, its manners and morals, its religious practices and beliefs, its education of children, and its regulation of the sexes and the family its homes and temples, markets and theaters and athletic fields, its poetry and drama, its painting, sculpture, architecture and music, its sciences and inventions, its superstitions and philosophies. I wish to see and feel these elements not in their theoretical and scholastic isolation, but in their living interplay as the simultaneous movements of one great cultural organism, with a hundred organs and a hundred million cells, but with one body and one soul. Excepting machinery, there is hardly anything secular in our culture that does not come from Greece. Schools, gymnasiums, arithmetic, geometry, history, rhetoric, physics, biology, anatomy, hygiene, therapy, cosmetics, poetry, music, tragedy, comedy, philosophy, theology, agnosticism, skepticism, stoicism, epicureanism, ethics, politics, idealism, philanthropy, cynicism, tyranny, plutocracy, democracy. These are all Greek words for cultural forms seldom originated but in many cases first matured for good or evil by the abounding energy of the Greeks. All the problems that disturb us today, the cutting down of forests and the erosion of the soil, the emancipation of woman and the limitation of the family, the conservatism of the established and the experimentalism of the unplaced in morals, music, and government, the corruptions of politics and the perversions of conduct, the conflict of religion and science, and the weakening of the supernatural supports of morality, the war of the classes, the nations and the continents, the revolutions of the poor against the economically powerful rich, and of the rich against the politically powerful poor, the struggle between democracy and dictatorship, between individualism and communism, between the East and the West. All these agitated as if for our instruction the brilliant and turbulent life of ancient Hellas, there is nothing in Greek civilization that does not illuminate our own. We shall try to see the life of Greece both in the mutual interplay of its cultural elements and in the immense five-act drama of its rise and fall. We shall begin with Crete and its lately resurrected civilization because apparently from Crete as well as from Asia came that prehistoric culture of Mycenae and Tyrans which slowly transformed the immigrating Achaeans and the invading Dorians into civilized Greeks. And we shall study for a moment the virile world of warriors and lovers, 
pirates and troubadours that has come down to us on the rushing river of Homer's verse. We shall watch the rise of Sparta and Athens under Lycurgus and Solon, and shall trace the colonizing spread of the fertile Greeks through all the isles of the Aegean, the coasts of Western Asia and the Black Sea, of Africa and Italy, Sicily, France and Spain. We shall see democracy fighting for its life at Marathon, stimulated by its victory, organizing itself under Pericles, and flowering into the richest culture in history. We shall linger with pleasure over the spectacle of the human mind liberating itself from superstition, creating new sciences, rationalizing medicine, secularizing history, and reaching unprecedented peaks in poetry and drama, philosophy, oratory, history, and art. And we shall record with melancholy the suicidal end of the Golden Age in the Peloponnesian War. We shall contemplate the gallant effort of disordered Athens to recover from the blow of her defeat. Even her decline will be illustrious with the genius of Plato and Aristotle, Apelles and Praxiteles, Philip and Demosthenes, Diogenes and Alexander. Then, in the wake of Alexander's generals, we shall see Greek civilization, too powerful for its little peninsula, bursting its narrow bounds and overflowing again into Asia, Africa, and Italy, teaching the cult of the body and the intellect to the mystical Orient, reviving the glories of Egypt in Ptolemaic Alexandria, and enriching Rhodes with trade and art, developing geometry with Euclid at Alexandria and Archimedes at Syracuse, formulating in Zeno and Epicurus the most lasting philosophies in history, carving the Aphrodite of Melos, the Laocoon, the victory of Samothrace, and the altar of Pergamum, striving and failing to organize its politics into honesty, unity, and peace, sinking ever deeper into the chaos of civil and class war, exhausted in soil and loins and spirit, surrendering to the autocracy, quietism, and mysticism of the Orient, and at last almost welcoming those conquering Romans through whom dying Greece would bequeath to Europe her sciences, her philosophies, her letters, and her arts as the living cultural basis of our modern world. Acknowledgements I am grateful to Mr. Wallace Brockway for his scholarly help at every stage of this work, to Miss Mary Kaufman, Miss Ethel Durant, and Mr. Louis Durant for aid in classifying the material, to Miss Regina Sands for her expert preparation of the manuscript, and to my wife for her patient encouragement and quiet inspiration. I am deeply indebted to Sir Gilbert Murray and to his publishers, the Oxford University Press, for permission to quote from his translations of Greek drama. These translations have enriched English literature. I am also indebted to the Oxford University Press for permission to quote from its excellent Oxford Book of Greek Verse in Translation. Chapter 1. Crete. 1. The Mediterranean. As we enter the fairest of all waters, leaving behind us the Atlantic and Gibraltar, we pass at once into the arena of Greek history. Like frogs around a pond, said Plato, we have settled down upon the shores of this sea. Even on these distant coasts the Greeks founded precarious, barbarian-bound colonies many centuries before Christ, at Hemeroscopium and Amphorius in Spain, at Marseille and Nice in France, and almost everywhere in southern Italy and Sicily. Greek colonists established prosperous towns at Cyrene in northern Africa and at Naucratus in the delta of the Nile. Their restless enterprise stirred the islands of the Aegean and the coasts of Asia Minor then as in our century. All along the Dardanelles and the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea they built towns and cities for their far-venturing trade. Mainland Greece was but a small part of the ancient Greek world. Why was it that the second group of historic civilizations took form on the Mediterranean, as the first had grown up along the rivers of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and India, as the third would flourish on the Atlantic, and as the fourth may appear on the shores of the Pacific? Was it the better climate of the lands washed by the Mediterranean? There, then as now, winter rains nourished the earth, and moderate frosts stimulated men. There, almost all the year round, one might live an open-air life under a warm but not enervating sun. And yet the surface of the Mediterranean coasts and islands is nowhere so rich as the alluvial valleys of the Ganges, the Indus, the Tigris, the Euphrates, or the Nile. The summer's drought may begin too soon or last too long, and everywhere a rocky basis lurks under the thin crust of the dusty earth. The temperate north and the tropic south are both more fertile than these historic lands, where patient peasants, weary of coaxing the soil, more and more abandoned tillage to grow olives and the vine and at any moment along one or another of a hundred faults 
Earthquakes might split the ground beneath men's feet and frighten them into a fitful piety. Climate did not draw civilization to Greece. Probably it has never made a civilization anywhere. What drew men into the Aegean was its islands. The islands were beautiful. Even a worried mariner must have been moved by the changing colors of those shadowed hills that rose like temples out of the reflecting sea. Today there are few sights lovelier on the globe, and sailing the Aegean one begins to understand why the men who peopled those coasts and isles came to love them almost more than life, and, like Socrates, thought exile bitterer than death. But further, the mariner was pleased to find that these island jewels were strewn in all directions, and at such short intervals that his ship, whether going between east and west or between north and south, would never be more than forty miles from land. And since the islands, like the mainland ranges, were the mountain tops of a once continuous territory that had been gradually submerged by a pertinacious sea, some welcome peak always greeted the outlook's eye and served as a beacon to ships that had as yet no compass to guide them. Again the movements of wind and water conspired to help the sailor reach his goal. A strong central current flowed from the Black Sea into the Aegean, and countercurrents flowed northward along the coasts. While the northeasterly Atesian winds blew regularly in the summer to help back to their southern ports, the ships that had gone to fetch grain, fish, and furs from the Euxine Sea. Fog was rare in the Mediterranean, and the unfailing sunshine so varied the coastal winds that at almost any harbor, from spring to autumn, one might be carried out by a morning and brought back by an evening breeze. In these propitious waters, the acquisitive Phoenicians and the amphibious Greeks developed the art and science of navigation. Here they built ships for the most part larger or faster and yet more easily handled than any that had yet sailed the Mediterranean. Slowly, despite pirates and harassing uncertainties, the water routes from Europe and Africa into Asia, through Cyprus, Sidon, and Tyre, or through the Aegean and the Black Sea, became cheaper than the long land routes arduous and perilous that had carried so much of the commerce of Egypt and the Near East. Trade took new lines, multiplied new populations, and created new wealth. Egypt, then Mesopotamia, then Persia withered. Phoenicia deposited an empire of cities along the African coast, in Sicily and in Spain, and Greece blossomed like a watered rose. 2. The Rediscovery of Crete There is a land called Crete in the midst of the wine-dark sea, a fair, rich land, begirt with water, and therein are many men past counting, and ninety cities. When Homer sang these lines, perhaps in the ninth century before our era, all dates in this volume are B.C. unless otherwise stated, or obviously A.D., Greece had almost forgotten, though the poet had not, that the island whose wealth seemed to him even then so great had once been wealthier still, that it had held sway with a powerful fleet over most of the Aegean and part of mainland Greece, and that it had developed a thousand years before the siege of Troy, one of the most artistic civilizations in history. Probably it was this Aegean culture, as ancient to him as he is to us, that Homer recalled when he spoke of a golden age in which men had been more civilized and life more refined than in his own disordered time. The rediscovery of that lost civilization is one of the major achievements of modern archaeology. Here was an island twenty times larger than the largest of the Cyclades, pleasant in climate, varied in the products of its fields and once richly wooded hills, and strategically placed for trade or war midway between Phoenicia and Italy, between Egypt and Greece. Aristotle had pointed out how excellent this situation was and how it had enabled Minos to acquire the empire of the Aegean. But the story of Minos, accepted as fact by all classical writers, was rejected as legend by modern scholars, and until sixty years ago it was the custom to suppose, with Grote, that the history of civilization in the Aegean had begun with the Dorian invasion or the Olympic Games. Then, in A.D. 1878, a Cretan merchant, appropriately named Minos Kalakyrinos, unearthed some strange antiquities on a hillside south of Candia. The great Schliemann, who had but lately resurrected Mycenae and Troy, visited the site in 1886, announced his conviction that it covered the remains of the ancient Gnosis, and opened negotiations with the owner of the land so that excavations might begin at once. But the owner haggled and tried to cheat, and Schliemann, who had been a merchant before becoming an archaeologist, withdrew in anger, losing a golden chance to add another civilization to history. A few years later he died. In 1893, a British archaeologist, Dr. Arthur Evans, bought in Athens a number of milkstones from Greek women who had worn them as amulets. 
He was curious about the hieroglyphics engraved upon them, which no scholar could read. Tracing the stones to Crete, he secured passage thither, and wandered about the island, picking up examples of what he believed to be ancient Cretan writing. In 1895 he purchased a part, and in 1900 the remainder of the site that Schliemann and the French school at Athens had identified with Knossos. And in nine weeks of that spring, digging feverishly with 150 men, he exhumed the richest treasure of modern historical research, the Palace of Minos. Nothing yet known from antiquity could equal the vastness of this complicated structure, to all appearances identical with the almost endless labyrinth so famous in old Greek tales of Minos, Daedalus, Theseus, Ariadne, and the Minotaur. In these and other ruins, as if to confirm Evans's intuition, thousands of seals and clay tablets were found, bearing characters like those that had set him upon the trail. The fires that had destroyed the palaces of Knossos had preserved these tablets, whose undeciphered pictographs and scripts still conceal the early story of the Aegean. Evans labored brilliantly at Knossos for many years, was knighted for his discoveries, and completed in 1936 his monumental four-volume report, The Palace of Minos. Students from many countries now hurried to Crete. While Evans was working at Knossos, a group of resolute Italians, Halbert, Pernier, Savignoni, Paribeni, unearthed at Hagia Triada, Holy Trinity, a sarcophagus painted with illuminating scenes from Cretan life, and uncovered at Festus a palace only less extensive than that of the Knossos kings. Meanwhile, two Americans, Seeger and Mrs. Hawes, made discoveries at Basiliki, Moklos, and Gurnia. The British, Hogarth, Bosenkut, Dawkins, Myers, explored Palaikastro, Sycro, and Zacro. The Cretans themselves became interested, and Xanthudidus and Hatsidicus dug up ancient residences, grottos, and tombs at Archilochori, Tylosis, Kumasa, and Kamaisi. Half the nations of Europe united under the flag of science in the very generation in which their statesmen were preparing for war. How was all this material to be classified, these palaces, paintings, statues, seals, vases, metals, tablets, and reliefs? To what period of the past were they to be assigned? Precariously, but with increasing corroboration as research went on and knowledge grew, Evans dated the relics according to the depth of their strata, the gradation of styles in the pottery, and the agreement of Cretan finds in form or motive with like objects exhumed in lands or deposits whose chronology was approximately known. Digging down patiently beneath Knossos, he found himself stopped, some forty-three feet below the surface, by the virgin rock. The lower half of the excavated area was occupied by remains characteristic of the Neolithic age, primitive forms of handmade pottery with simple linear ornament, spindle wars for spinning and weaving, fat-buttocked goddesses of painted steatite or clay, tools and weapons of polished stone, but nothing in copper or bronze. Classifying the pottery and correlating the remains with those of ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt Evans divided the post-Neolithic and prehistoric culture of Crete into three ages, early, middle, and late Minoan, and each of these into three periods. The first or lowest appearance of copper in the strata represents for us, through a kind of archaeological shorthand, the slow rise of a new civilization out of the Neolithic age. By the end of the early Minoan age, the Cretans learned to mix copper with tin, and the Bronze Age begins. In Middle Minoan I, the earliest palaces occur. The princes of Knossos, Festus, and Malia built for themselves luxurious dwellings with countless rooms, spacious storehouses, specialized workshops, altars, and temples, and great drainage conduits that startled the arrogant Occidental eye. Pottery takes on a many-colored brilliance, walls are enlivened with charming frescoes, and a form of linear script evolves out of the hieroglyphics of the preceding age. Then, at the close of Middle Minoan II, some strange catastrophe writes its cynical record into the strata. The palace of Knossos is laid low as if by a convulsion of the earth, or perhaps by an attack from Festus, whose palace for a time is spared. But a little later a like destruction falls upon Festus, Maklos, Gornia, Palaikastro, and many other cities in the island. The pottery is covered with ashes. The great jars in the storerooms are filled with debris. Middle Minoan III is a period of comparative stagnation, in which perhaps the southeastern Mediterranean world is long disordered by the Hyksos conquest of Egypt. In the late Minoan age everything begins again. Humanity, patient under every cataclysm, renews its hope, takes courage, and builds once more. 
New and finer palaces rise at Knossos, Festus, Tylissus, Hagia Triada, and Gornia. The lordly spread, the five-storied height, the luxurious decoration of these princely residences suggest such wealth as Greece would not know till Pericles. Theatres are erected in the palace courts, and gladiatorial spectacles of men and women in deadly combat with animals amuse gentlemen and ladies, whose aristocratic faces, quietly alert, still live for us on the bright frescoes of the resurrected walls. Wants are multiplied, tastes are refined, literature flourishes. A thousand industries graciously permit the poor to prosper by supplying comforts and delicacies to the rich. The halls of the king are noisy with scribes, taking inventories of goods distributed or received, with artists making statuary, paintings, pottery, or reliefs, with high officials conducting conferences, hearing judicial appeals, or dispatching papers stamped with their finely wrought seals, while wasp-waisted princes and jeweled duchesses, alluringly décolleté, crowd to a royal feast served on tables shining with bronze and gold. The sixteenth and fifteenth centuries before our era are the zenith of Aegean civilization, the classic and golden age of Crete. 3. The Reconstruction of a Civilization If now we try to restore this buried culture from the relics that remain, playing Cuvier to the scattered bones of Crete, let us remember that we are engaging upon a hazardous kind of historical television, in which imagination must supply the living continuity in the gaps of static and fragmentary material artificially moving but long since dead. Crete will remain inwardly unknown until its secretive tablets find their champollion. 1. Men and Women As we see themselves pictured in their art, the Cretans curiously resemble the double axe so prominent in their religious symbolism. Male and female alike have torsos narrowing pathologically to an ultra-modern waist. Nearly all are short in stature, slight and supple of build, graceful in movement, athletically trim. Their skin is white at birth. The ladies who court the shade have fair complexions, conventionally pale. But the men pursuing wealth under the sun are so tanned and ruddy that the Greeks will call them, as well as the Phoenicians, Phoenikes, the purple ones, redskins. The head is rather long than broad, the features are sharp and refined, the hair and eyes are brilliantly dark, as in the Italians of today. These Cretans are apparently a branch of the Mediterranean race. The men as well as the women wear their hair partly in coils on the head or the neck, partly in ringlets on the brow, partly in tresses falling upon the shoulders or the breast. The women add ribbons for their curls, while the men, to keep their faces clean, provide themselves with a variety of razors, even in the grave. The dress is as strange as the figures. On their heads, most often bare, men have turbans or tam o' shanters, the women magnificent hats of our early twentieth century style. The feet are usually free of covering, but the upper classes may bind them in white leather shoes, which among women may daintily be embroidered at the edges with colored beads on straps. Ordinarily, the male has no clothing above the waist. There he wears a short skirt or waist cloth, occasionally with a codpiece for modesty. The skirt may be slit at the side in working men. In dignitaries and ceremonies, it reaches in both sexes to the ground. Occasionally, the men wear drawers, and in winter, a long outer garment of wool or skins. The clothing is tightly laced about the middle, for men as well as women are resolved to be, or seem, triangularly slim. To rival the men at this point, the women of the later periods resort to stiff corsets, which gather their skirts snugly around their hips and lift their bare breasts to the sun. It is a pretty custom among the Cretans that the female bosom should be uncovered or revealed by a diaphanous chemise. No one seems to take offense. The bodice is laced below the bust, opens in a careless circle, and then in a gesture of charming reserve may close in a Medici collar at the neck. The sleeves are short, sometimes puffed. The skirt, adorned with flounces and gray tints, widens out spaciously from the hips, stiffened presumably with metal ribs or horizontal hoops. There are in the arrangement and design of Cretan feminine dress a warm harmony of colors, a grace of line, a delicacy of taste that suggest a rich and luxurious civilization already old in arts and wiles. In these matters the Cretans have no influence upon the Greeks. Only in modern capitals have their styles triumphed. Even staid archaeologists have given the name La Parisienne to the portrait of a Cretan lady with profulgent bosom, shapely neck, sensual mouth, impudent nose, and a persuasive, provocative charm. 
She sits saucily before us today as part of a frieze in which high personages gaze upon some spectacle that we shall never see. The men of Crete are evidently grateful for the grace and adventure that women give to life, for they provide them with costly means of enhancing their loveliness. The remains are rich in jewelry of many kinds, hairpins of copper and gold, stick pins adorned with golden animals or flowers, or heads of crystal or quartz, rings or spirals of filigree gold mingling with the hair, fillets or diadems of precious metal binding it, rings and pendants hanging from the ear, plaques and beads and chains on the breast, bands and bracelets on the arm, finger rings of silver, steatite, agate, carnelian, amethyst, or gold. The men keep some of the jewelry for themselves. If they are poor, they carry necklaces and bracelets of common stones. If they can afford it, they flaunt great rings engraved with scenes of battle or the chase. The famous cupbearer wears on the biceps of his left arm a broad band of precious metal, and on the wrist a bangle inlaid with agate. Everywhere in Cretan life man expresses his vainest and noblest passion, the zeal to beautify. This use of man to signify all humanity reveals the prejudice of a patriarchal age and hardly suits the almost matriarchal life of ancient Crete. For the Minoan woman does not put up with any oriental seclusion, any perda or harem. There is no sign of her being limited to certain quarters of the house or to the home. She works there, doubtless, as some women do even today. She weaves clothing and baskets, grinds grain and bakes bread. But also she labors with men in the fields and the potteries, she mingles freely with them in the crowds, she takes the front seat at the theater and the games, she sweeps through Cretan society with the air of a great lady bored with adoration. And when her nation creates its gods, it is more often in her likeness than in man's. Sober students, secretly and forgivably enamored of the mother image in their hearts, bow down before her relics and marvel at her domination. 2. Society Hypothetically, we picture Crete as at first an island divided by its mountains among petty jealous clans which live in independent villages under their own chiefs and fight, after the manner of men, innumerable territorial wars. Then a resolute leader appears who unites several clans into a kingdom and builds his fortress palace at Knossos, Festus, Tylissus, or some other town. The wars become less frequent, more widespread, and more efficient in killing. At last the cities fight for the entire island, and Knossos wins. The victor organizes a navy, dominates the Aegean, suppresses piracy, exacts tribute, builds palaces, and patronizes the arts, like an early Pericles. It is as difficult to begin a civilization without robbery as it is to maintain it without slaves. The power of the king, as echoed in the ruins, is based upon force, religion, and law. To make obedience easier, he suborns the gods to his use. His priests explain to the people that he is descended from Belkanos, and has received from this deity the laws that he decrees. And every nine years, if he is competent or generous, they reanoint him with the divine authority. To symbolize his power, the monarch, anticipating Rome and France, adopts the double axe and the fleur-de-lis. To administer the state, he employs, as the litter of tablets suggests, a staff of ministers, bureaucrats, and scribes. He taxes in kind and stores in giant jars his revenues of grain, oil, and wine. And out of this treasury in kind he pays his men. From his throne in the palace or his judgment seat in the royal villa, he settles in person such litigation as has run the gauntlet of his appointed courts. And so great is his reputation as a magistrate that when he dies he becomes in Hades, Homer assures us, the inescapable judge of the dead. We call him Minos, but we do not know his name. Probably the word is a title, like Pharaoh or Caesar, and covers a multitude of kings. At its height, this civilization is surprisingly urban. The Iliad speaks of Crete's ninety cities, and the Greeks who conquer them are astonished at their teeming populations. Even today the student stands in awe before the ruined mazes of paved and guttered streets, intersecting lanes and countless shops or houses, crowding about some center of trade or government in all the huddled gregariousness of timid and talkative men. It is not only Knossos that is great, with palaces so vast that imagination perhaps exaggerates the town that must have been the chief source and beneficiary of their wealth. Across the island on the southern shore is Festus, from whose harbor, Homer tells us, the dark prowed ships are borne to Egypt by the force of the wind and the wave. The southbound trade of Minoan Crete pours out here, swelled by goods from northern merchants who ship their cargoes overland to avoid a long detour by perilous seas. 
Festus becomes a Cretan Piraeus, in love with commerce rather than with art. And yet the palace of its prince is a majestic edifice, reached by a flight of steps forty-five feet wide. Its halls and courts compare with those at Knossos. Its central court is a paved quadrangle of ten thousand square feet. Its Megaron, or reception room, is three thousand square feet in area, larger even than the great hall of the double axe in the northern capital. Two miles northwest is Hagia Triada, in whose royal villa, as archaeological imagination calls it, the prince of Festus seeks refuge from the summer heat. The eastern end of the island in Minoan days is rich in small towns, forts like Zacro or Maklos, villages like Pressus or Syra, residential quarters like Palicastro, manufacturing centers like Gornia. The main street in Palicastro is well paved, well drained, and lined with spacious homes. One of these has twenty-three rooms on the surviving floor. Gornia boasts of avenues paved with gypsum, of homes built with mortarless stone, of a blacksmith's shop with extant forge, of a carpenter shop with a kit of tools, of small factories noisy with metalworking, shoemaking, vase-making, oil refining, or textile industry. The modern workmen who excavate it and gather up its tripods, jars, pottery, ovens, lamps, knives, mortars, polishers, hooks, pins, daggers, and swords, marvel at its buried products and equipment and call it He Mechanicae Polis, the town of machinery. By our standards, the minor streets are narrow, mere alleys in the style of a semi-tropical orient that fears the sun, and the rectangular houses of wood or brick or stone are for the most part confined to a single floor. Yet some middle Minoan plaques exhumed at Knossos show us homes of two, three, even five stories, with a cubical attic or turret here and there. On the upper floors in these pictured houses are windows with red panes of unknown material. Double doors, swinging on posts apparently of cypress wood, open from the ground floor rooms upon the shaded court. Stairways lead to the upper floors and the roof, where the Cretan sleeps when the nights are very warm. If he spends the evening indoors, he lights his room by burning oil, according to his income, in lamps of clay, steatite, gypsum, marble, or bronze. We know a trifle or two about the games he plays. At home he likes a form of chess, for he has bequeathed to us in the ruins of the Knossos Palace a magnificent gaming board with frame of ivory, squares of silver and gold, and a border of seventy-two daisies in precious metal and stone. In the fields he takes with zest and audacity to the chase, guided by half-wild cats and slender thoroughbred hounds. In the towns he patronizes pugilists, and on his vases and reliefs he represents for us a variety of contests, in which lightweights spar with bare hands and kicking feet, middleweights with plumed helmets batter each other manfully, and heavyweights, coddled with helmets, cheekpieces, and long padded gloves, fight till one falls exhausted to the ground and the other stands above him in the conscious grandeur of victory. But the Cretan's greatest thrill comes when he wins his way into the crowd that fills the amphitheater on a holiday to see men and women face death against huge, charging bulls. Time and again he pictures the stages of this lusty sport, the daring hunter capturing the bull by jumping astride its neck as it laps up water from a pool, the professional tamer twisting the animal's head until it learns some measure of tolerance for the acrobat's annoying tricks, the skilled performer, slim and agile, meeting the bull in the arena, grasping its horns, leaping into the air, somersaulting over its back, and landing feet first on the ground in the arms of a female companion who lends her grace to the scene. Even in Minoan Crete this is already an ancient art. A clay cylinder from Cappadocia, ascribed to 2400 B.C., shows a bull-grappling sport as vigorous and dangerous as in these frescoes. For a moment our oversimplifying intellects catch a glimpse of the contradictory complexity of man as we perceive that this game of bloodlust and courage still popular today, is as old as civilization. 3. Religion The Cretan may be brutal, but he is certainly religious, with a thoroughly human mixture of fetishism and superstition, idealism and reverence. He worships mountains, caves, stones, the number three, trees and pillars, sun and moon, goats and snakes, doves and bulls. Hardly anything escapes his theology. He conceives the air as filled with spirits, genial or devilish, and hands down to Greece a sylvan ethereal population of dryads, Silene, and nymphs. He does not directly adore the phallic emblem, but he venerates with awe the genitive vitality of the bull and the snake. Since his death rate is high, he pays devout homage to fertility, 
and when he rises to the notion of a human divinity, he pictures a mother goddess with generous mammy and sublime flanks, with reptiles creeping up around her arms and breasts, coiled in her hair, or rearing themselves proudly from her head. He sees in her the basic fact of nature, that man's greatest enemy, death, is overcome by woman's mysterious power, reproduction, and he identifies this power with deity. The mother goddess represents for him the source of all life, in plants and animals as well as in men. If he surrounds her image with fauna and flora, it is because these exist through her creative fertility, and therefore serve as her symbols and her emanations. Occasionally she appears holding in her arms her divine child, Velkanos, whom she has born in a mountain cave. Contemplating this ancient image, we see through it Isis and Horus, Ishtar and Tammuz, Sibylle and Attis, Aphrodite and Adonis, and feel the unity of prehistoric culture and the continuity of religious ideas and symbols in the Mediterranean world. The Cretan Zeus, as the Greeks call Velkanos, is subordinate to his mother in the affections of the Cretans, but he grows in importance. He becomes the personification of the fertilizing rain, of the moisture that in this religion, as in the philosophy of Thales, underlies all things. He dies, and his sepulchre is shown from generation to generation on Mount Euctas, where the majestic profile of his face can still be seen by the imaginative traveler. He rises from the grave as a symbol of reviving vegetation, and the Kurites priests celebrate with dances and clashing shields his glorious resurrection. Sometimes, as a god of fertility, he is conceived as incarnate in the sacred bull. It is as a bull that he mates in Cretan myth with Minos's wife, Pasiphae, and begets by her the monstrous Minos bull, or Minotaur. To appease these deities, the Cretan uses a lavish rite of prayer and sacrifice, symbol and ceremony, administered usually by women priests, sometimes by officials of the state. To ward off demons, he burns incense. To arouse a negligent divinity, he sounds the conch, plays the flute or the lyre, and sings, in chorus, hymns of adoration. To promote the growth of orchards and the fields, he waters trees and plants in solemn ritual, or his priestesses in nude frenzy shake down the ripe burden of the trees, or his women in festal procession carry fruits and flowers as hints and tribute to the goddess who is born in state in a palanquin. He has apparently no temple, but raises altars in the palace court, in sacred groves or grottos, and on mountaintops. He adorns these sanctuaries with tables of libation and sacrifice, a medley of idols, and horns of consecration, perhaps representative of the sacred bull. He is profuse with holy symbols, which he seems to worship along with the gods whom they signify, first the shield, presumably as the emblem of his goddess in her warrior form, then the cross, in both its Greek and its Roman shapes, and as the swastika, cut upon the forehead of a bull or the thigh of a goddess, or carved upon seals, or raised in marble in the palace of the king. Above all, the double axe, as an instrument of sacrifice magically enriched with the virtue of the blood that it sheds, or as a holy weapon unerringly guided by the god, or even as a sign of Zeus the thunderer cleaving the sky with his bolts. Finally, he offers a modest care and worship to his dead. He buries them in clay coffins or massive jars, for if they are unburied they may return. To keep them content below the ground, he deposits with them modest portions of food, articles for their toilet, and clay figurines of women to tend or console them through all eternity. Sometimes, with the sly economy of an incipient skeptic, he substitutes clay animals in the grave in place of actual food. If he buries a king or a noble or a rich trader, he surrenders to the corpse a part of the precious plate or jewelry that it once possessed. With touching sympathy, he buries a set of chess with a good player, a clay orchestra with a musician, a boat with one who loved the sea. Periodically he returns to the grave to offer a sustaining sacrifice of food to the dead. He hopes that in some secret Elysium, or islands of the blessed, the just god Radamanthus, son of Zeus Velkanos, will receive the purified soul, and give it the happiness and the peace that slip so elusively through the fingers in this earthly quest. 4. Culture The most troublesome aspect of the Cretan is his language. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.